welcome to London Insight and to this day. Hopefully it's going to be a day of uplift and a little bit of softening for the heart and perhaps also a day where we can sort of contact our intentions for our life and for our practice and bring them forward into the new year. So uh, obviously the day is about the power of metta, so I want to talk about that from metta as a practice to also metta as an attitude and a behavior because really it's not a a sort of secondary practice. Sometimes people think that the path is basically a path of uh, insight or calming the mind, and they think that metta is something on the side of that, but actually it comes into both of those practices, and it's an integral part of the path. Hello, David. Yeah. I'm just getting triply recorded now. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, bring it down. Yeah, great. So David's one of our volunteers, actually, for the Bikini Project, and he's been recording all the talks for Ajahn Brown's tour. <laughs> so I'd better be careful what I say now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So first I wanted to define what metta is. And the word metta comes from the root mitta, which means friendliness or friendship. And... Uh, This is different from other definitions of love in the suttas. There are other definitions which mean like uh, affection, which is piya, or um, kind of erotic or sensual love, which is karma. Um, There's even a word for paternal love in the suttas, and also another kind of love which is a sort of trusting, warm, safe feeling that maybe we get with our teacher. But metta is known as the most exalted kind of spiritual love. (coughs) And it has all the synonyms. One of the synonyms is um, adosa, which means a lack of anger, or avyapada. It's the same thing. And it's uh, one of the three right intentions for practice. Um, what's that? Ud- anudaya is another Pali word. And I love this word because it means empathy. And this is very much an integral part of, of what metta means. I actually disagree with one of my teachers who says that metta is just <laughs> well-wishing and a goodwill and um, can be quite almost uh, intentional, but doesn't necessarily have to carry that emotional resonance or that connection. And I I kind of argue with him. It's not Ajahn Brahm, it's another teacher, and say, no, empathy is a really important part, because to me, empathy is an ability to contact your own suffering and uh, implies a sort of healthy relationship in knowing how to work with your emotions. And it's only when we know how to work with our own emotions that we can have that empathetic resonance with others. And I think without that, it's very difficult to know how to love a person in a way that's most beneficial and effective and appropriate in a given circumstance. So to me, empathy is a really important (coughs) part of of metta as well. And um, I'm assured that I'm not being uh, a naughty nun by contradicting this particular (laughs) teacher because he says it's good to argue with your teachers. So so <laughs> I would encourage that, you know, and I would encourage during this day for everybody to find their own relationship to what metta means for you. So metta is not a, a kind of sugar coating. It's not a, a sort of sentiment that tries to cover up the difficulties in life or sort of suggest that we don't suffer, that we don't feel anger towards others or towards ourselves. You know, it's much more of a, a sentiment of bringing forth a certain attitude and behavior in life which can be expressed through body, speech, or mind. There's one really lovely place in the suttas that talks about um, loving kindness as one of the principles that conduces to cordiality. And this is particularly important for living in community or in society. And uh, let me find the exact words that the body uses because it's very beautiful. These days you have tablets and all this kind of stuff. So we're not in the days of the Buddha, but I'm sure you would have approved. (laughs) So yeah, um, metta is known as one of the principles of cordiality, which creates affection and respect. So affection is also part of loving kindness. I know somebody asked me to talk about that. You know, is metta just a sentiment that remains detached from others, or can it include affection? And I think it can include touch. It can include you know, putting your hand on the shoulder of somebody who's suffering or struggling. Even this morning in the car when we were coming here, I was sort of feeling a bit sick because my stomach's playing up and sort of trying to relax myself. And suddenly these two warm hands came from behind me and started to massage my shoulders. 
And it was so lovely. She's responsible. <laughs> it was so lovely and just helped me relax. And I thought, that's metta. That's metta in action through touch. So it's not that, you know, there can't be any sort of intimacy. In fact, intimacy, I think, is also a part of loving kindness. If we don't have an interest in someone or something, then we don't tend to care very deeply about them. So, so that's affection and respect. Of course, respect is a natural. It's a given. You know, we're all human beings trying our best, subject to our own conditioning. And I think uh, this really helps, you know, when you understand that everybody is conditioned, everybody has their own struggles. We don't know necessarily what people are dealing with at any given time. So, you know, sometimes we judge people too harshly. And then we found out that, you know, perhaps they lost a child or perhaps, you know, some other tragedy hit them in their life. And it's so much easier at that point to, to have compassion and, and meta. Yeah. But I always ask myself, you know, can we not just give that benefit of the doubt, even without knowing? Yeah. And it says that um, it conduces to cohesiveness, to non-dispute, to concord and to unity. So these are the bodily, verbal, mental acts of loving kindness. And the Buddha says these should be done in openly as well as in private. In other translations, it says in public as well as in private. And I think this is also lovely, and, and it points towards an integrity, you know, that our speech and our behavior should be in line with what we think, what our highest values are. You know. It's easy to talk about things, but how do they manifest? It's not that we have to be perfect, you know, we can be very honest about our weaknesses, but, uh, you know, we're aiming to have this sort of integrity so that our mental world and our behavior and our thoughts and our speech is in line. Yeah? There's not a big dis disparity there. So they were three of the principles of cordiality. And the other three are um, sharing whatever's given as if, it's, you know, you're, as if it's belongs to everybody. So, for example, if you have a meal, the Buddha said, don't let one meal go by without sharing that with someone. So here he's advising the monks and the nuns to you know, always share the contents of their alms bowl. So when we finish, we don't just say, okay, it's just food, just chuck it in the bin. It's like, would anyone else like to have some of this? And this creates concord, unity, respect, harmony and community. And then the other one is sharing the same unblemished virtue. So again, that means practicing the sila in life, you know, practicing kindness in thought, word and deed. And having the same idea about that, you know, maybe engaging in discussion about that or reflection with others. And then the last one is having in common the perfect view. So the perfect view, according to the Buddha's teachings, is the view that leads to full awakening. So it's not that one is right or wrong, but it's just what are you actually aiming for? You know, if you're aiming for liberation, there's a certain kind of view that supports that. You know, the view of karma that there is a result of our actions. If there was no result to our actions, then there'd be no point really living the holy life or, li or even trying to practice meditation. You know. But we understand that there is an outcome, there is a consequence of the way we behave and the way we relate to others. That's what karma means in a nutshell. You know, it's our attitude to life, it's our relationship with the world and with our inner world as well. So these things conduce to a harmonious society. And of course, metta is also the opposite of ill will. And the Buddha goes as far to say that there's nothing other than metta that, you know, is better at preventing unarisen or ill will from arising and also the ill will that has arisen from being dissolved. You know, so, so it kind of protects us from those negative emotions and also nips them in the bud if they do arise. So as far as we develop these wholesome states of metta, ill will is undermined bit by bit. And he gave this teaching to his own son who then went on to become enlightened, so... It's a very, very powerful method. And of course, ill will is one of the hindrances to meditation. I don't know if everybody knows about the five hindrances, but um, yeah, these are the main obstacles to deepening our practice. And ill will is sort of head of the list in a way. Um, because if you have ill will, you know, subtle variations of that might be the tiredness or the doubt or, or the restlessness. You know, they're all kind of aspects of, of a kind of negative relationship to our inner world. You know, we're struggling somewhere. And so, you know, maybe we don't want to know, we don't want to feel, so we become drowsy, you know. Or we're a bit confused and don't know what to do with those emotions, so we go off into doubt. It's a reaction to an unpleasant situation inside, a lack of clarity. Yeah. 
And the restlessness, of course, is not being happy where we are. It's wanting to go off into the future or into the past, anything other than where we are. <laughs> so the mind becomes restless, it creates stories or fantasies, dramas, all kinds of things, because it's preferable to being calm and being quiet. So these are some aspects. And the other aspect of metta, which I think is really beautiful, is this unconditionality. So it's a sense of love that gives without wishing for anything in return. And in the process of meditation, that really means being able to give to the process. You know, loving kindness gives to the process without <laughs> expecting anything in return. So it's not only in our relationship to others, but also in what we come here for. You know, are we coming here to meditate to get something, to polish up our ego or create a spiritual ego? Or are we just coming to give to the practice? This is something I always ask myself when I'm coming to teach because I'm not naturally comfortable with speaking to large groups. I don't think anybody really is. You know, They say that public speaking is a fa- you know, more frightening than death or something <laughs> on the list of biggest fears. <laughs> but you know, I noticed right in the beginning I tried to change my relationship to that by thinking this isn't about what I'm doing or you know, me sitting here and saying the right things. It's about giving. It's just an opportunity to give space for people to practice and to come in contact with their own heart. You know? And it's the same with the practice. You know? We come to the practice to, to make peace, to, make, to learn to be gentle with ourselves, especially our inner world, <coughs> yeah? and to learn how to relate to that with kindness. That's more important. I mean, when you die, what do you want to be remembered for? Oh, this is the one who got this state of meditation, you know, and then she sat for six hours the other week and, you know, or she got this college degree or this Ferrari or, you know, big bank balance. I don't think people talk about that at the funeral. (laughs) Yeah, I just attended a funeral of a very dear friend about uh, less than two weeks ago. And again and again, people were talking about her generosity, her acts of charity, her radiance, her smile. You know, all the ways she served. And that was what was emotional for us all. And it was a lesson, you know. She had this beautiful coffin, which was made of cardboard, basically. It's very, very simple. And, uh, and we had these lovely lotus flowers that somebody had made, kind of bright pink and yellow origami lotuses. And one by one, towards the end, we were invited to come and place these flowers, which had a bit of sticky tape on the back, place them on the coffin. And there were these beautiful photos of, of this lady on the coffin with the most radiant smile. She actually made a joke about it with the tissues. It said something like, these tissues are for I don't want anybody to cry here. Every time you cry, you get a fine. But I understand that tears might be natural. So, you know, use these tissues to dry your tears and then remember my radiant smile and smile with me until we meet again. Something like this. And it was very touching, really touching. So we were going up with these lotuses, putting them on the coffin and seeing this radiant smile, you know, and you just felt, yeah, this is a life well lived. Yeah. This is a life that touches the hearts of so many people. And that's what's really important. It's not where we get to in our practice, in our life, any of that. It's, you know, the qualities we wish to be remembered for. And I think the most beautiful quality of the human heart is the capacity to love and to feel, to empathize, yeah? to know how to be compassionate, which is another aspect of love. <coughs> the difference between compassion and metta <coughs> metta is usually translated as loving kindness or loving friendliness kind of altruistic love um, a well wishing a protective energy and compassion is more a response to people when they're suffering and in a way you can just see it as a slight different relationship that love has according to a different object yeah So it's the same sentiment, but it just responds slightly differently to someone in suffering. So if somebody is, you know, crying and really terribly upset or going through despair or grief, it's not always very sensitive to say, may you be happy. Because they're not happy. (laughs) You know, it's like asking someone to feel differently than they feel or asking them to snap out of it, you know. And actually at that point, the first response, I think, which is helpful, is just to say, you know, I see that you're suffering. You know, may you come out of your suffering, or may you learn even to embrace your suffering. You know, or what does this need right now? You know, what do you need right now? And respond to that. So, love is is nuanced, and it responds differently to different situations, different people, different times. So, we need a very flexible mind to practice the metta. And luckily, it is something that can be cultivated. 
So I'm going to talk about how we can use metta as an intention towards our practice, but also how we can cultivate it, and that will be more in the second part of the day. Um, yeah, but about the unconditionality, which I think is interesting. I um, picked up a book recently called Like Milk and Water Mixed, and it's by a monk called um, S. Damika. He's a bit of a rebel monk, I think, who thinks for himself, lives alone, and does a lot of reading and research and you know, applies the Dhamma in his way, but very analytical. And he was saying, is there really anything that we can call unconditional love? Because ultimately everything in life is created, you know. Every phenomenon in the world comes around through a complex sort of web of causes and conditions, you know, many, many things coming together. So is love ever really unconditional? But I think the conclusion he made, and, and I'm inclined to agree, was that there can be different levels of unconditionality. So some love is more refined than others. So, for example, the kind of love which is often, you know, a part of uh, romantic love is a wish for some kind of reciprocation, of course, right? I mean, if we're in love with somebody who doesn't give that back, very quickly it'll die out or we'll feel very hurt and, you know, move on to the next person, basically. So it usually has one recipient, yeah? And even in the Buddha's teachings, when the Buddha talks about um, metta as like the love of a mother, even as a mother protects with her life, her child, her only child. It doesn't stop there. It's not only the mother's love for her child. He says, with a boundless heart, one should develop metta to all living beings in the way a mother loves her child. So it's much more expansive than ordinary love or ordinary attachment, which does demand something in return. You know, even if it's something as simple as in a friendship, we wish that another person will share the same interests or have time for us. Um, nothing wrong with that at all, but the kind of metta we're looking to develop here is something much more exalted, something much less demanding, and the kind of love that frees rather than controls another. Another aspect is apamanya, which means non-judgment or non-measuring. Sometimes it's translated as boundless, but it really means without measure. Without uh, <coughs> Manya means measure. And... Uh, it's lovely to be around people who embody these qualities because over time you start to get a sense of what that really means when you live with a person, when you're around a person a lot. And one of the examples I, uh, I always reflect on is with my teacher, Ajahn Brahm. For me, he's a symbol of unconditional love. And I know that it has no demands, although he asked me to do this. If I said to him, you know, really, this is too much, you know, doing this monastery thing <laughs> from scratch on my own, you know. He would understand. He'd say, okay, you've given it your best. You know. But I always wonder, why does he have confidence in me? And I think it's, it's not personal. It's not that he has confidence in me as a person. He just has confidence in the Dhamma, and he has confidence in the right intention. You know, and the intention is very much one of gratitude and inspiration. And, yeah, he's seen me go through very difficult times in my monastic life. There's been many times that I've been to him. For me, a teacher's like a doctor, so you don't hide what you're going through. You know, you don't just go and say, okay, very good, Bante, I agree with everything you say. You know, I argue with my teacher, and I tell him if I'm upset and depressed or whatever. So he's seen me go through some difficult times. And then about two years ago, when he first came over to England to teach, I said to him, what do you think, Ajahn? You know, a couple of years ago, you saw me really depressed, really upset, you know, not really doing very well, not really sure where my monastic life was going. And now I'm, I'm, I'm a bit better, aren't I, you know, because I felt psychologically healthier. And he said, oh, really? I don't know. I said, well, come on, you know, you've seen me a few years ago, really upset, and now I feel much more confident. What do you think? Do you think there's a change? I honestly don't know, he said. I don't judge. And I thought that was so powerful. Because it's like, we often think of judgment as something very fixed, like you are like this, this, this. But it was even more than that, you know. It was actually not sort of <coughs> hanging on anything, like not fixing me in any way. Not even really remembering or thinking at the time, oh, she's depressed. He saw beyond that. And I think that's what I get when I sit with him. And I know a lot of you who've met him feel the same, you know. He sees beyond the surface stuff that's going on in the mind to the heart. And because he sees that, that brings that out. It brings it out. Yeah. There was a really interesting um, study, a scientific study that I read about recently, um, and it was talking about the relationship between uh, trauma and addiction. 
and they found out that there were three psychiatrists, I think, from the University of California in a book called, what was the book called? Something about love, general theory of love. Um, and they found out that children, it's quite natural, that grow up in a healthy environment, in a safe environment, have a kind of neural wiring which means that their brain is very resilient, like the centres for compassion and love are, are well-developed, let's say. Yeah? Whereas children that grow up in an environment of trauma, it's quite the opposite of a loving and safe environment. And they don't have such healthy neural wiring, so to speak. Not that we have wires and stuff in our head. But <laughs> um, yeah, and, and this had consequences in later life. The people that were growing up in a very safe environment, had a stronger resilience when things went wrong in adult life. Yeah? But on the other side, it, had, it, it spoke of hope to me because it showed that the brain can be healed and rewired. Yeah? And so they had this experiment in Portugal where they um, helped people who were addicts, and these people often had cases of trauma in the past. They helped them to make this connection again with society because perhaps they didn't feel valued in their family, but they could find healing through feeling valued in the society, in the community. So they made these programs where they had some kind of relationship with people around them. I'm not exactly sure of the details. But they found that 50% of uh, addictions basically vanished. So 50% of people were free from addiction and healed through that. So sometimes we need the love of another person to reflect to us our own in, inner worth, you know, and our own ability to value ourselves, which we've often forgotten about. You know, we don't really value ourselves. We're always looking at the bits which are wrong. You know? And the Buddha gave clear instructions for this. He said that, you know, basically, if you see the faults in somebody, which includes yourself, try and focus on the positives instead. He said it's like there's a pond and it has beautiful clear water, but it's overgrown by moss at the edges. So what do you do? Do you just focus on the moss and get upset about the moss or do you actually move it aside, move it aside to the edges of the pond so that you can see the beautiful pure water and you can drink from that? So in the same way, we can overcome some of our anger or irritation or you know, self-criticism, self the inner critic, the inner tyrant, by just moving aside that moss and looking at the beauty that we have in our hearts. And there's plenty of that in everybody here. Otherwise, you wouldn't spend one precious day of the weekend coming for a meditation retreat. You'd be much more worried about your studies or, you know, the presentation you've got to make next week or, you know, getting on with the housework or whatever it is. But no, instead you want to cultivate the heart, knowing that from a cultivated heart, you can bring forth much more good in the world and much more healing to others. So that's really beautiful, and that's worthy of really reflecting on and appreciating. So there's gratitude and appreciation is an aspect of metta. And also an ability to forgive. Yeah? So metta doesn't hold grudges or resentments. doesn't keep a little list of all the things you've done wrong. <laughs> yeah. That's the amazing thing about my teacher. There's just nothing in that book. <laughs> you know, there's an ability to just meet people in the present moment without any fixed idea, or preconceived idea. And you feel that. You know, it's like meeting a new person again every time. <coughs> So that's roughly speaking what metta is, but of course metta is also an emotion. Not only an emotion, but it does carry a very positive, warm, a sort of yeah, rewarding emotion with it. So we start off with the intention, but that does translate bit by bit into a feeling and an emotion. But I also wanted to talk a bit about the context of metta in the Buddha's teachings, because as I said, it's not necessarily a separate practice, but it's an integral part of the path as a whole. <coughs> And in the suttas, um, one of the most uh, common teachings that you'll find is surprisingly not on mindfulness, not even on vipassana. I don't think the word vipassana is used very much at all in the suttas, but it's on the gradual training. And the gradual training comes up about 40 times throughout the suttas, in various suttas in slightly different order. But it basically starts from contentment and from establishing the right motivation to practice. So one of the um, phrases that the Buddha uses is, uh, just as I recoil from pain and desire happiness, so do all beings. So I practice out of sympathy and compassion for all beings. And this is really beautiful because it immediately undermines any sort of spiritual materialism. You know, I'm practicing for me. I'm practicing to get something. Or even to change someone else. You know, sometimes we think, oh, let's have metta for that person. 
so that they'll change a bit and be nicer to me. <laughs> but that's not really the motivation. It's out of compassion and sympathy for living beings. Yeah? Understanding that they also suffer. They also subject to death, subject to sickness, yeah? just as we are. And we're very fragile, very fragile. So that's the motivation side. And then from there, you know, the Dalai Lama has this nice saying. He says that um, the more you cultivate the heart or the more you practice from the heart and give emphasis to developing the heart, the more fearless and free your actions will be. And I think that's really important too because metta is not some sort of wishy-washy sort of covering, you know, on real feelings or emotions. It's not a fragile state. It's not something that can be easily overturned. It actually requires a lot of courage and a lot of fearlessness to really love, you know, even when you're being maybe manipulated or, I mean, in that case, it's good to leave the situation. I wouldn't suggest staying in it, but, you know, sometimes people might be spreading rumors about you which are untrue. Lots of things can happen, right? And it's easy enough to feel meta towards people when they're behaving well, but how about when they're not? <laughs> so we're sending meta to them, not to change them, but just out of sympathy and compassion that they're suffering. That's why people behave badly. Yeah. So we start from that premise, and also in the suttas there's many places where it says that people first observed the precepts and then they went on to develop the loving kindness. But the next part of the gradual training is also called sense restraint. And I think this is really interesting, because we often think sense restraint means just looking at the floor <clears throat> which is actually not that difficult. You can get a hat, you know, with edges and a visor, and you can just look at the floor for like 10 days, 30 days. I was on a retreat once. I was doing that for about 30 days, and I put my laundry in somewhere around day 10. <laughs> and uh, they washed your clothes for you because it was such a huge retreat of about, I don't know, 200 people. And I never found my laundry. I thought, oh, it's just gone. Okay, fine. You know, it's all secondhand stuff anyway. This is before I was a nun, because you only have one row, but I'd have been more upset about that. <laughs> but uh, I realized about two days before the end of the retreat that there was another path. I was keeping my eyes down so I could get to the dining room. Food came first, you know, even before clothes. And, uh, and then I realized some people were walking that way, so I kind of looked up a little bit. And I saw that the laundry was there on tables with everybody's, you know, number or whatever. I was like, oh, my goodness, it's been there for the last 20 days. And I never <laughs> saw it. <laughs> so that's not really wise sensory strength. I mean, it was very nice not to see anybody or know where I was going, except from the, my meditation to the dining room. But uh, it meant I didn't have any clean clothes. So sensory strength in the suttas actually means practicing right effort. It, it correlates with right effort which is to notice how unrisen, unwholesome states come to rise, yeah? how they get eliminated, and then how pleasant states come to rise and get developed, right? roughly speaking. So it might be a lot to take in. I always get confused with that. But uh, basically, it means learning to use your perception or your attention in a way that gives rise to wholesome states. Yeah? So again, it's like this simile with the pond. You can look on a person's you know, negative qualities on your own negative qualities and all the things you need to improve to be enlightened, which actually is not the point. Um, or you can look at the beautiful things, and it tends to be that whatever you give attention to grows. Yeah? It's like the simile of the weeds in the garden. If you give attention to the weeds and put some fertilizer on them, they grow, or water them and they grow. But if you water the flowers, then the flowers grow, and eventually they swamp the weeds. Yeah? There is a, also a practice of taking out the weeds, <coughs> but I think that's a, a sort of sideline practice. The main thing is look after the flowers, and the weeds will just yeah, disappear on their own. So, so we learn to do that through right effort, and also through right uh, effort and this sense restraint, we start to develop happiness. And this is a different kind of happiness than sensual pleasure. Happiness is a huge part of the path. Because it's from happiness that we actually still the mind and enter the deep states of samadhi. Yeah. So happiness starts to arise at the level of sila already, and that's called blameless happiness, and avadja sukha in the Pali. Um, and this is the kind of happiness of when you haven't done something negative or you haven't reacted with anger when you could have done. You know? But it's also the happiness that comes through active practice of virtue, such as giving somebody a gift or being generous when you didn't have to be, or just smiling at someone in the tube, for example, you know, or letting them get in first. Because we had a situation recently where there were three tubes that came past and there was no way we could get in. It was absolutely chock-a-block. 
So a few people did get in before us, and we're like, okay. You could see how it would cause arguments, you know, or how it could cause arguments, but sometimes we just give way when we don't have to, yeah. So the happiness starts to arise. And then the happiness from the sense restraint starts to be an internal happiness. You know, it starts to be more connected to those feelings of, in a way, self-respect as well, yeah? Feelings of uh, doing the right thing, feeling you can trust your own goodness, you can trust the way you're observing life and, and others. And you start to have a sense of inner integrity. And there's a happiness to that. It's subtle, but I think we need to notice it. It's very, very different to remorse and regret or to resentment and you know, lack of forgiveness. It's a different emotion. So we're already starting to turn inwards and find happiness from there. And from there, we can develop the deeper states of samadhi because we start to undermine the coarse hindrances. Yeah? So with sense restraint, we're undermining more and more subtle hindrances, such as sense desire, ill will, restlessness, tiredness, and, all, and doubt, yeah? getting some confidence in the path. And from there, we can go into the practice. At that stage already, the metta's working as an attitude, as a way of looking. And then we can go on to develop metta as a samadhi practice, so really cultivate it. And the Buddha says when it's really cultivated, it's the most powerful thing to completely overcome ill will. Mindfulness doesn't do it on its own. Yeah? You need metta to overcome ill will. <coughs> and even after these states of samadhi, the idea is that the mind is so... Um, I like to think of it as molten gold because there's this lovely simile about you know, purifying the gold from all the impurities such as tin and copper and lead or whatever used to be in gold, I don't know. And, uh, and so it's really melted down. It's very soft and it's radiant as well. It's luminous. So it's soft, which means it can see things in a different way. It's not fixed. Yeah, it has resilience. So if it sees something that's maybe shocking, such as the fact that everything is impermanent, it has that resilience. It doesn't shape the mind. Yeah, and it's also very bright. So it has this kind of ability to penetrate, and it's steady. So it can stay with things for a long, long time. And this is what gives rise to the insight. If our mind's flitting about from here to there, it's very hard to sustain it on any particular phenomena. Yeah. And the more we look at something, the more it opens up to us. So the mind becomes very, very malleable. I love that word. And then we can really get into the deep states of uh, meditation and also practice metta in the way the Buddha intended, by spreading it out unconditionally to all beings, universally. Yeah. The scope of metta is boundless and impartial, as I said before. Yeah. It goes to all Regardless, it's like the sunshine shining down on everybody. It doesn't choose, you know, I'll shine on this little spot. Seems like it does that in England. I won't shine on this little spot. <laughs> but when it shines, it shines on everyone yeah, equally, and it touches everybody. Nobody's unaffected by the warmth of the sun. Yeah. And then even one step further than this, you know, when you do develop the still states of mind and the happiness and the wisdom, metta is the power that, enables you to teach, right? Because if it's just about our own liberation, I mean, we can stop there. But there are many people that haven't had contact with the teachings and that are hungry for the Dhamma, thirsty for the Dhamma. And uh, there's this story of a monk in uh, Thailand, one of Ajahn Brahm's friends, called Ajahn Gunha. I think he was a, <coughs> a relation, maybe a nephew or a second cousin of Ajahn Chah. And uh, Ajahn Chah, one evening, asked the monks after... I don't know, maybe it was a rains retreat or a long retreat. He said, are, are there any of you here with no more defilements? And of course, there's everyone, mm -hmm, well, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I probably have a few left. And, but this monk said, yeah, no more defilements, which is a big thing to say because as a monastic, if you make a claim that's untrue, it's actually a disrobing offense. You can never be a monastic again because you're misleading people, right? Maybe you want more support, so you say, oh, yeah, I'm you know, really great in my meditation. Come feed me, you'll get merit. You know? So you're not allowed to do that. So, But he said, yeah, me, I, I, uh, I don't have more defilements now. And then Ajahn Chah said, come to my room. <laughs> so everyone was wondering, what did he say? What did he say? Did he give him the second degree or third degree? But uh, what he said and shared with the other monks afterwards was that now he should develop metta. That's his job now is to develop metta. Yeah? Because in order to teach, you need to have that care, that interest in others, the empathy, 
yeah, the wish to, to bring goodness, to bring happiness to others. Without that, you're not going to be <coughs> very productive or very helpful. Of course, you can teach by osmosis too, and some people do. There are some monks or nuns who live very solitary lives and don't really teach. But uh, I think if you want to establish community and you want to establish a harmonious one and a, safe, a, a place of safety where others can come and practice, you need such places, then you do need to develop metta. So that was his job at that point, specifically to concentrate on that. But of course, we can develop it from the beginning, and we should develop it from the beginning because it's the second factor of the Eightfold Path. And I think, you know, when you're looking at the Eightfold Path, you need to bear in mind that these factors are all linked up. And the Buddha taught the Eightfold Path as the way out of suffering. He didn't teach a one-fold or a two-fold path. <coughs> that means every factor of the path needs to be cultivated. And also that the stronger the preceding factor, you know, the more it feeds into the, the next factor. So by strengthening one, you're strengthening all. The path kind of keeps coming around in a loop. And eventually, when everything's really well developed, each factor is holographic, so it contains all the other steps. Yeah. So right mindfulness also contains right view. It depends on right view. It depends on the kind intention. Yeah. It will also have a degree of samadhi. Yeah. A degree of right effort, which knows how to work with the defilements and the sealers there from the beginning. So in the eightfold path, we start with right view, which is a basic understanding that there is a result to our deeds. There is a karmic consequence, if you like. Not like a fate, because it's not something fixed, but there is simply a result. You know, When I do an act of kindness, I feel a warmth, I feel a warm glow, and the other person responds, usually. Right? If they don't respond straight away, you break them down. <laughs> <laughs> you just keep going. <laughs> and eventually there's a response. Yeah. So, yeah. And from there, it's natural to observe sila. I mean, if you have only intentions of gentleness, non-harm, kindness, letting go. Letting go means kind of giving. It's a kind of giving away, giving up. If you only have those kind of motivations, how can you really break the precepts? You know, you live a naturally virtuous life. Yeah? So that's where the right action, right livelihood, right speech comes into it. And we'll talk about that a bit later, but I just wanted to talk about the context and also... Um, a little bit about relationship. Yeah, There was another study <coughs> that I read about. It was the longest study they've ever done on happiness. And it spread across, I don't know, maybe 60-odd years. It's one of the TED Talks, and I forget the person's name. But if you look it up, it's the longest study that's ever been done on happiness and the constituents of happiness. And they found quite clearly that the most um, predetermined, the, the best determinant of uh, happiness was the quality of one's close relationships, which means loving, warm, safe relationships. And this wasn't just a kind of clinical study. They actually went to people's houses, they did video interviews, they sat with them, they talked to the family members, they also measured brain activity, and this was across many years. So many of these men, actually, were 20 when they started the study, now they're in their 80s. And it showed that their health was better, their memory was better, even if they argued with the spouse. It didn't have so much impact if they had a loving relationship and if they could count on that person it didn't have the same impact their memory was still better their health problems were m much less I think the ones who had conflicted relationships usually started to have health problems in their 50s this is not a guarantee by the way and it doesn't mean if you've got health problems you're not a nice person <laughs> but uh, you know this was what the study showed and I thought that was so interesting. There was also something about pain and the relationship to pain. Those in loving, safe relationships, when they were faced with chronic pain, their mood remained the same, which is really interesting. But those who were in like, high-conflict, unhappy relationships, when they had pain or you know, illness, their mood plummeted. So I just find this so interesting because it shows how perception is so conditioned you know, by our state of mind. Not only perception, but our actual experiences change according to the state of our mind. Yeah. So this is really interesting, and I wanted to um, start the day, start the next meditation, in uh, looking at right intention. Yeah. So right intention, again, just to summarize, is an intention of non-ill will, avyapada, the synonym of metta. So that's metta. And then ahimsa which you may know from uh, Gandhi, which means nonviolence. Yeah? My teacher translates that as gentleness. 
So it's not just the love and the kindness, it's also the way we hold experience. It's with a gentle heart or a gentle hand, if you like. You know, when you're dealing with emotions or feelings in the body, you sort of hold it in a gentle way. And gentle means spacious as well. It means you give things space, even difficult emotions, so that there's an opportunity for them to heal. Things can't heal if there's no space for them. Yeah? So you have this sense of spaciousness and patience too. And then the last of the right intentions or motivations is letting go. It's actually nekama, which means renunciation. But in meditation practice, that really means a kind of letting go to the process, learning not to control things too much, and giving, like having an intention of giving. So I'm giving to this process rather than controlling it. Yeah? I'm giving all my love. I'm giving my trust. <coughs> I find that really helpful. Like give trust to whatever arises. So these three constitute the right motivation so I thought we'd look at metta in that context first and then uh, so we'll do a meditation followed by a walking meditation and after lunch we'll look more at cultivating metta as a kind of uh, practice that fills <coughs> the mind yeah so as a, as a cultivation which is a little bit more focused yeah good so if you would like to uh, stand up maybe and just uh, Give the body a bit of a, a stretch.